Our second presentation is by Albert de Vries, and he's talking about the optimal number of lactations for a dairy cow. Okay. Well, thank you for uh, that um, invitation again to talk about the economics of uh, productive life and longevity. Um, and I'm in Florida, as everybody knows now. So I, too, found some old cows. Uh, apparently, the oldest cow ever lived, at least you know, recently, was an Irish cow, Big Berta, who was almost 49 years old when she died. This is in 1993. And then I just uh, looked around some on the internet and I found a Dutch cow that turned 20. When a cow turns 20, she gets in the local press. That is quite, quite, uh, you know, quite an event. And like we've discussed earlier, uh, we see though that the average productive lifespan is less than uh, three years, okay? Or if you add them um, from birth to first calving, the, these cows live maybe five to six years old only. Okay, I like to use perhaps the word productive lifespan um, in versus longevity. Longevity um, has a little bit of a connotation as if we let the cow live as long as possible, how long would she live? Or productive lifespan, um, has the idea that we farmers uh, make decisions on how long these cows can stay, either a voluntary cull or an, an involuntary cull. But regardless, we're talking about the same concept here. When you ask farmers, which cows actually survive in your farm? Okay, they tell me it's cows you don't see. These cows in the US would have four events per lactation, four times that they're sort of set apart. Of course, they start with the calving. Then we breed them, and one breeding, one insemination gets them pregnant. We do a pregnancy diagnosis routinely, and then we dry them off, and she calves again. So she does not get caught for mastitis or lameness or, or any disease, uh, which would increase that number of events there. Now, of course, too many cows have more than four events per lactation. So some of these risk factors then are these cows are sick, they're lame, as I mentioned, they don't get pregnant. Um, some do have poor confirmation, like the other doesn't hold up, or they're lame. It's a little bit perhaps bad temperament, but you don't see much culling for that. And then low milk yield. Low milk yield can be genetics, but it can also be the result of everything else, right? The cow was sick, had mastitis, was lame, and so on. And so... How can we reduce those risk factors? Well, cow comfort often was not optimal. And I'm with cow comfort, um, you're talking about uh, bedding where the cow lays, ventilation in the barn, you're talking about nutrition, for example, calving area, all those I fit into cow comfort. So we have to fix those things in order to um, get more cows into our four events per lactation. The previous speaker already alluded to this. Um, I sometimes hear that we want to um, maximize lifetime profit per cow. And I will argue as somebody in the US who thinks about economics quite a bit and talks to uh, producers about economics that that's not necessarily our economic goal, okay? The economist would tell you, you optimize your profit per most limiting factor. And so, if you have a, a fixed barn capacity with a fixed number of cows, you would say, well, this is my dollars per cow per year. The time unit is, is relevant here. Here I include both um, milking cows and dry cows in my dollars per cow per year. In the US though, we see often that milking capacity is a limiting factor because our parlors run um, all the time. Uh, with some cleaning, obviously. If you have a milk robot, also your uh, limiting factor could be milking cow per year, okay? In a quota system, per kilo is milk or per fat. Perhaps labor is a, a limiting factor. I think if you go to the Netherlands, phosphate is a, is a limiting factor there. New Zealand would have it per acres, for example, okay? So the limiting factor is important. Um, when you look at life or profit per cow per year versus per milking cow per year, um, I think the end result um, in terms of number of lactations is actually fairly similar. So what I want to do, I want to walk everybody through a, a simple model 
to determine what is the average number of lactations. And in this case, the average number of years the cow should stay in the herd um, after first calving. And it's, I'm gonna tell everybody, it's a simple model. It, the purpose is really to get us think about sort of five factors that determine then if we could choose how long would these cows stay in the herd, okay? And we did publish this simple model in the Journal of Dairy Science. So the first thing is herd replacement cost. Um, we uh, obtain a heifer, we raise a heifer, we purchase a heifer. Um, in the US cost is say $2,000 to get a heifer from birth to first calving or we purchase them. But by the time these cows leave herds um, for, uh, you know, killing like they have no future production uh, in front of them anymore, they are severely depreciated, say down to $500 or so, depending on the market, right? So if you spread out this depreciation over more time, then obviously your cost of just maintaining a cow in the herd um, is lower. And you see that on my graph here. Um, this is the depreciation. So the difference between the heifer um, purchase cost or the raising cost minus the cull price, let's say $1,500, say 2,000 minus 500, 1,500. And then if I spread it out over more years into the herd, obviously my depreciation cost of keeping that cow in the herd is, uh, is diluted and decreases, okay? Again, this is a simple model. I presume here that one lactation is one year. I think we all know that uh, on average lactations are a little longer than, than one, one year. So I will present um, four or five of these charts that summarize then where we are with cost structure. And I've added here uh, the herd replacement cost, okay, that we just saw. And I think I just did a depreciation here of just $1,000. So from 2000 down to 1000 which in the US would be a pretty high um, uh, cull income, okay? And again, at the bottom, we see animal cull rate, and you can convert that into the average number of years the cow is in the herd after first calving. And in the yellow, you see then again that uh, the, the cost of uh, depreciation per year then decreases, okay? On the right axis um, um, is the opportunity cost from optimal. Uh, the blue line um, hits zero where uh, the top of the bars is uh, the lowest, okay? So this is obviously an extreme uh, situation here. Um, I went from 50% cull rate to 10%, and obviously, you know, the, the longer you can spread out herd replacement cost over more time, uh, the lower that cost of the depreciation per year is. But that's not the only thing. Right. Here's a slide actually from uh, Zoetis. Um, I like it because it illustrates uh, the concept of maturity of milk production. Okay, and so we're looking at the blue bar here. At the bottom is lactation number or parity group. Um, on the left hand is milk per cow per day. Um, and so calculated then per three or five day milk yield. And we see that first lactation cows um, produce less milk than second lactation cows, who again produce less milk than third. And we have the highest milk production per cow, essentially in 305 days uh, in, in fourth and fifth parity. And then in this data, um, when cows got past the fifth lactation, um, their daily milk yield started to, to decrease some. Now, the challenge with uh, this type of data is that there is uh, um, some bias because of culling, right? Cows that actually do survive until the next lactation are usually uh, the better producing cows. So we cannot necessarily look at, say, uh, this milk yield in the fifth lactation and believe that every first lactation cow uh, would get there because we have um, culled the low producing cows out of that. So it's, it's a little bit tricky uh, to determine, especially for individual cows, what she will do at, at maturity. But usually we think that um, a first lactation cow produces maybe 80% uh, of what a mature cow would do. So I'm building this uh, 
this uh, total cost of keeping the cow in the herd, and we just thought about replacement cost, depreciation, um, we can also then use this uh, concept of maturity. So this is an opportunity cost. This is a lack of maturity cost in the green here. Okay, that means that if I have a first lactation cow, perhaps I make $500 less in that lactation than a mature cow at the fifth and sixth lactation. All right, so it's an opportunity cost. If I have um, a lot of first lactation cows, that means these cows take up a spot in my barn, um, a, a slot, if you will, and they're making $500 less than uh, if I had a mature cow in that barn, in that slot at that time. So it's, it's, it's money not made by having a lot of first and second lactation cows. Um, the principle um, also extends then uh, to the right where we have a very old cows. I call it aged cow cost. It's an opportunity cost by maybe having some cows being there too long. Now I put a big question mark in here because I don't really know what those aged cow costs are. There's the, the culling uh, uh, bias again that influences that. But the principle I think is, uh, is sol solid that there is perhaps around the fifth and sixth lactation those cows, um, again, if they were just all healthy, would be our most profitable cows. I also assume that there is no genetic progress in the data that uh, gets to this graph here, okay? We'll talk about genetic progress in a, in a little bit here. All right, so I'm using now my lack of maturity cost and my age cow cost, the green and the pink, and I add that to my depreciation cost, my herd replacement cost, okay? Um, so some of it, the yellow would be real cost, the green would be, um, and, and the pink would be opportunity cost. And I think this concept is valid. We're, we're adding these costs now together and we're still looking for the lowest bar, okay? The lowest of the sum of these bars. And we're still getting to very old cows here. And again, very pretty extreme, right? But the idea here is to think about these concepts and then perhaps uh, later we can fill in and fine tune some of these assumptions some. But I think we're on the right track here. That's still not everything, right? One uh, argument you can make in favor of uh, longer productive life is saying, well, I may not need a heifer a replacement calf out of all my calvings, right? So. For example, I would perhaps use some uh, sex semen and create a herd replacement out of my better cows. In addition, I can perhaps create higher valued calves out of uh, the cows that I do not need to create replacements for my herd. And so I call that here in a premium of higher value to surplus calves, perhaps that's a, a crossbred calf, for example, uh, that's my uh, little blue here, okay? And I, that's again, an opportunity cost. I can make fewer of those higher valued surplus calves if I have a very high cull rate or the alternative then is, you know, a very low uh, productive life. So I added that up here. This also speaks in favor of older, older cows, okay? Well, we're still not there yet. Um, one of the arguments we I often hear is says yeah but you know my heifers are my um, <clears throat> are my future here. So um, let's let's look at that a little bit. So this is a net merit dollars. It's an economic selection index. Okay, uh, economic selection index in the U.S. This is for Holsteins in red and white. And if we look at the blue and the red here. And you will see this graph very similar in basically all countries. Then uh, the red are the sires genetics and the blue are the cow genetics and the sire genetics are better than uh, the cow genetics because basically a cow is an old sire if you think about it. And if you look at, well, have we made, built through genetics a more profitable cow? And yes, uh, through selection, we really have uh, made quite a bit of difference in the, uh, the profitability of our cows, the potential profitability. And in this data, which spans about from 1975 to about now, so um, let's say that's a good um, 45 years here, uh, these cows, would, the current cows would be 
about almost $800 more profitable per lactation. Okay. And we also see that this genetic lag between sires and cows is, is growing. You can see that around 2010, we saw an increase in the slope of genetics. Through genomic testing, our sires are getting faster, quicker. So if our replacement animals are getting genetically better and even faster, a lot of farmers would say, but therefore I cannot afford to milk these old uh, long longevity uh, cows. I need to get my newest genetics in the herd as quickly as possible. And that would drive up, increase my kill rate and therefore actually be an argument against longer productive life, okay? But when I try to add this opportunity cost into my model, indeed, as you can see from the blue and from the top of the bars, it does uh, argue to some extent for um, cows that have a little bit shorter productive life. Um, here, I was actually quite generous. I have a, a very high increase in genetics. $75 in the, in the, in the US uh, per year. That's probably a little overestimated uh, at this point. And if our uh, genetic progress is a little lower than what I have in this graph, that would argue by moving this, uh, this blue curve a little bit to the right, again, in favor of uh, longer uh, productive uh, lives. So um, regardless, the genetic increase does move, um, shorten the productive life to some extent, but yet with when I do some variations in my assumptions, I found find optimal productive lives, optimal number of lactations that are actually quite a bit longer, higher than what we currently do and see in the US. Okay, our, our the USDA, uh, the United States Department of Agriculture calculates with 2.8 uh, lactations uh, per, um, for longevity. And if this simple model holds, that means that we should really think in terms of uh, keeping cows longer in the herd because there's economic oppor uh, opportunity there. And the increase in genetics does not argue for a very young herd. In fact, we should really, in the US, to drive to um, have longer productive lives than what we currently are seeing. But of course, we have to give these cows the opportunity to get there, right? So, so health and management are very important. We have to create that opportunity. All right, I am getting close to the end here. Um, in the US, we actually have a breeding value for productive life, okay? And that is, um, do these cows have the ab ability to stay longer in the herd? And when I look at... Uh, <clears throat> at this data over time from the 1962 uh, almost today, we see that we have added genetically 20 months longer productive life to our cows. So if you look at the genetics of a current cow versus the one in 1960, we have built a better cow and also because we've been breeding for more functional traits uh, like better reproduction uh, lately and, and you know, ability to stay of, of 20 months. Well, if in 1960, say our cull rate was 33%, that would mean that today, if we have implemented this better ability of our cows to stay in the herd, we would be having a 21% cull rate. And that would be five lactations, but we're not seeing that in farms, okay? So we don't observe this. Now, does the genetics not hold? I would argue the genetics is solid, but we have to think as farmers about capturing um, that longer productive life. When I hear our farmers talk, they still are in the mindset of about one heifer per one cow, okay? And that if you can't control or don't want to control your number of heifers, you are automatically going to find cows to cull because you have these heifers culling. And so if we don't break that mindset about, hey, let's think about, uh, culling decisions, for example, do we really have to cull all these cows? Then also, I don't think we're going to see all the benefit of uh, the ability for these cows to stay longer in the herd, right? So it's one thing to provide good health, good comfort, so these cows have the ability to stay in the herd. 
but I think we also have work to do to show farmers that now you have a little bit more options and actually we have to break the mold of really trying to replace these cows, especially because our genetics is so much better and there's value in actually uh, building uh, a little bit of an older herd that needs to be to some extent controlled by a lower number of heifers there. So I'm wrapping it up here. Um, my summary, my be home message, if you will. Um, first, it starts, we, ha we have to create conditions for cows to stay in the herd, okay? I mean, if they all break down, have a lot more than four events per lactation, there's not much choice, I think, okay? Um, mature cows are most profitable, fourth, fifth lactation, perhaps. So can we milk more of those, okay? The argument that genetic gain of heifers really should argue for a very high curl rate is a thing that I hear. I don't think uh, holds up. The, the, the pull from increased genetic gain uh, is not strong enough to argue for a very uh, um, short productive life here. Um, I think more lactations, that means going into fifth, six lactations are likely economically justified. If we can break uh, our thinking about how do we get our cows there and then which ones do we actually uh, keep. So I do, in that regard, here in the U.S., some calls to help rank cows for profitability. Uh, that goes because our farmers do realize to some extent they have more healthy cows. Um, and so I think what we're trying to do is both work on the health aspects, but also we have to work on the economic aspects of which cows can stay and should stay in the, in the herd a little longer, considering we have an alternative of a heifer that comes into the herd. Okay, and that ends my presentation here. Thank you so much, Albert. Um, and we have a, a lot of questions coming in from uh, people watching. The first that I'd like to put to you is, wouldn't it be an idea to reduce the number of lactations and make each lactation longer and thus reduce the risk period in a cow's lifetime? Yeah, that, I like that idea a lot, actually. Okay. Um, I think there we have to, uh, we have work to do with farmers because, for example, we see our farmers know that uh, if cows don't get pregnant on time and they get pregnant late on lactation, they're often fat at calving. Okay, and that uh, a high body condition score cow has a lot higher risk of being cold, for example. So we, we have to learn how to manage for cows that are actually uh, get pregnant later. Um, for example, by changing the ration. Okay, so we, we're not seeing uh, fat cows, but indeed you would actually shrink uh, the number of dry days and you would shrink um, that transition uh, cooling risk. So I do like the idea of uh, extending voluntary waiting period and, and spread out lactation length over time, yes. Super, thank you. Another really lovely question, this is from Maurice, who asks, is milking Jersey cows 7,000 grams, a uh, kilogram, sorry, 6% fat, 4% protein, not more profitable than milking Holstein cows with 12,000 kilograms, 4.2% fat and 3.5% protein? Well, okay, so I think in the US, you know, I think uh, the judge on that are our dairy farmers. And so um, about 85% of the cows that we milk in, in the United States are Holsteins. We do see though an increase in the number of jerseys. Jerseys is our second uh, breed, uh, probably up to, up to 10%. And over time, I've seen perhaps some uptake in the number of jerseys being milked versus Holsteins. Um, so, but if they're the judge, right, I don't see a transition from moving from all Holsteins to all Jerseys, at least not in this country here. Thank you. Another question just come in, I'm asking if you have any data on feed efficiency when comparing heifers, uh, second lactation versus older cows, fourth, fifth lactations. Um, well, I have to look up that data necessarily. I do think that the, the fourth, fifth lactation cow is a more feed efficient cow, in part perhaps because that first lactation cow uh, needs to grow a little bit uh, more. Um, so my, what, I, what I do believe is that that older cow is more feed efficient at this point. Okay, lovely, thank you very much. 
Okay, Albert, uh, you you rightly believe that uh, in most countries the average number of lactations uh, should go up. And you also uh, mentioned the fact that in some farms cows are culled because a heifer is coming. So that should change. But uh, if now uh, I stop doing that, so I only cull cows if I have to cull them, uh, what do I do with uh, a cow that's going to its fifth or sixth lactation? And, you know, there's no problems, no mastitis, no lameness, no nothing. Production is reasonable. Would you keep on milking that cow or would you at some point still cull it because it's getting too old? You know, I think I think if we cull cows, there's something wrong with them. So if we have a fifth, sixth lactation cow, and you know she has consistently uh, sort of gotten pregnant at first breeding, second breeding, which sort of caused her to get there, I think there's reason to keep her in the herd. I would, you know, not likely say, well, because she is an old cow, I need to, you know, I better cull her. Um, of course, at some point, it is a trade-off, right? I mean that that older cow that is producing, doing well, producing a certain amount of milk versus perhaps a younger cow that, you know, maybe had a little bit more future in front of her. And so I do think it is somewhat of a trade-off, but I would not um, suggest that a simple rule is that you have to cull old cows just for the fact that they're old. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, and we have a question Tom, from Thomas here, which is building on what you just said. He's, he said, how, does, how do you suggest uh, people should decide on which animals to cull? Because someone needs to go. Well, I can give you the, the theoretical answer. And that is you have to look into the future of this cow, right? It's a matter of uh, future cash flow, really. Um, so uh, obviously, I think we're, we're quite influenced by how this cow was doing in the past. And as, as that's fair as long as what the cow was doing in the past is a predictor for, for future. So it's somewhat of work in, in, in progress, uh, how to rank out for future profitability. The ec economists um, knew how to do this 50 years ago. We've sort of failed to really pick up their methods, um, but I do believe, you know, there's uh, there's uh, an opportunity again to to apply some solid economics and especially break the idea to um, that, you know, uh, that the younger cow pushes out the older cow, because I think if we rank cows uh, and we do that always compared to a potential replacement animal and we consistently start to go cows that actually have positive values, which means they're more valuable than the heifer. Um, I think that helps drive uh, the idea that, well, maybe, you know, we should uh, not bring in uh, these new heifers and, and therefore not make these new heifers or not purchase these new heifers. So my answer is I don't really have a simple algorithm to tell you how to rank these cows, but um, hopefully that's uh, forthcoming pretty soon here. It's, it's one area I work on, for example. Super, thank you. Albert, I've been told we have time for one more question to you. So I'm going to ask the following from Carlos. Do you believe that the high level of inbreeding that is known today in the Holstein breed can be one of the major reasons for cows not lasting longer on the farm? I would, when I hear my US geneticists on inbreeding, then there's a concern that inbreeding uh, in increases but not in terms of a major reason, okay? Because, I mean, the inbreeding gets accounted for when we um, calculate um, genetics in, the, for example, our economic selection index, and that includes, um, you know, how long cows stay in the herd, that productive life breeding value that I showed. So if it was true that very high, or I just say increased inbreeding, had a big effect on cows not staying in the herd, then that would actually uh, discredit inbreeding and we would be uh, not, not doing as much inbreeding as we're currently doing. So I would say it plays somewhat of a role, but I would not call it major, frankly. Okay, super. Thank you so much, Albert, for sharing all of your thoughts and opinions um, in response to the questions. We're very grateful to you.